Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wish I could have been here all day. I was giving a midterm exam down at Wharton. So, but I'm looking at the content, and I got to tell you, it is great to be home. And I'm saying that not only because I'm a native New Yorker, although I don't like to admit that to a lot of people, and I've worked for 30 odd years to lose the accent, but, uh, but to be back home talking about CLV. Because I've been working on this stuff for, for decades, uh, and, and it's been interesting that when I started working on this stuff, again, you know, 20 years ago, people were saying, what's that? And what's its role in, in marketing? You know, like, well, who's going to use this stuff? Uh, and it's been interesting because now companies know it, they appreciate it, but there's still some questions, or worse yet, there's arrogance, there's lack of questions about exactly what do we mean by that? How do we really measure it? So here's who I am. I am the world's school marm on CLV. I look at the way that people are talking about it, I look at the way that people are calculating it, I look at the way that people are applying it, and I wrap their knuckles real hard. Because for the most part, the way it's being implemented, the way it's being spoken about, the way it's being sold to upper management is bad. I think we're actually underselling the concept and underselling the value of our customers. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of the right ways to do it and some of the patterns. Uh, we, we've seen some, or you've seen some, from some of the earlier decks. I want to take just a slightly deeper dive, but I also want to blow through it as quickly as possible, because after wrapping people's knuckles, I then want to have a little group therapy so we can talk about uh, your own observations, concerns, aspirations about CLV. I don't really need to motivate it very much, since you kind of know why it's important, but I'm going to do it anyway. And in fact, I want to uh, take uh, issue with one thing that, that Cassie said, two things, actually. <laughs> they, they, go, they go together. What is the ultimate metric? It's not conversion. <laughs> you know what it is? It's a metric that I bet that none of you or your companies talk about, but you think about all the time. And that's the idea of customer equity. Customer equity. And so what is customer equity? It's I'm going to add up CLV for every one of my customers, not only the existing ones, but the future ones. Okay, I'm going to use the same models, that, well, different models, but the same overall mental methodology that I used to, to project CLV. I'm going to project the new number of customers that I'm going to get. I'm going to ask myself, uh, you know, how, how many of them will I have in the future? What will their CLVs be? When I add all that up, that's the overall profitability of my current and future customer base. And if you think about it, in many, many cases, that's the value of the firm. Right? In most cases, the value of the firm is nothing more than the profits that we're going to get from our current existing customers. So conversion and open rates and all kinds of other metrics are means to that end. But that's the thing we want to be uh, aspiring towards. And Cassie at some point said, we want to be real careful about thinking about the implications of our actions on things like brand equity. Now, brand equity is nice. Yeah, whatever. But Brand, to me, brand equity is a stepping stone towards customer equity. All of us, the kinds of firms represented here, have the capability to be calculating CLV. Therefore, you have the capability to be calculating and reporting and being held accountable on customer equity. Brand equity, I mean, look, I'm not in any way going to deny the importance of branding, both from, from a consumer standpoint and from a firm standpoint, but measuring it trying to go to your CFO and saying, here is the value of my brand equity, what are you going to get out of that? You're going to get some laughs, you're going to get some raised eyebrows. It is impossible to measure the value of the brand, no matter what people say. Customer equity is possible because CLV can be measured with a reasonable degree of precision, and the important part is coming up with a reasonable degree of standards so we can agree upon how to do it. Anyway, let me very briefly motivate it in a way that perhaps you haven't thought about, and then, we'll, then we'll, we'll take the deep dive. And I'll start by asking another question about a single metric. Okay, so put aside CLV, and if we're going to say, you know, it's going to be gauged on how good you've been uh, doing customer acquisition, what is the metric that we use to, to gauge and guide our customer acquisition efforts? So our acquisition people live and die by those three letters. What are they? What is it? CPA. CPA, right? We live and die by cost per acquisition. And I want to emphasize that, that it's a terrible, tragic mistake. I'm not only saying that focusing on CPA will kind of leave you a little bit off the bullseye, but it's going to take you completely off the path. It is, it is a, it's a terrible, terrible mistake to evaluate and, and, and run your acquisition efforts on the basis of CPA. 
And why is that? Because we get so obsessed with costs. Let's see whatever we can do to drive those costs down as low as possible. And why is that? Because the costs are so visible, they're so tangible. Thanks to Google and curses to Google, we see those costs all the time. We feel the pain of acquiring every customer. And so it's hard to avoid holding people accountable for it. But if you think about it logically, instead of just this visceral reaction, oh, it's expensive to acquire customers. If you think about it logically, okay, we should be focusing less on the cost of the customers and more on the value of the customers, right? Look, we like to think about our customers as assets, don't we? We wish we could put something like customer equity on our balance sheet. And in fact, there's a few firms that are making steps in that direction. I really encourage you to do that. So to the extent that our customers are assets, well, let's think about other kinds of assets. I mean, other, other assets like these. Okay, employees, lawyers, technology. So th think of, have you ever heard a company say this? Well, he's a lousy lawyer, but he was cheap. <laughs> You're never going to say that. Because when it comes to acquiring lawyers, and hopefully when it comes to acquiring employees, what do you want? The best. The best. So why isn't it that way with our customers? So why is it that we obsess over pennies when there's dollars to be gained and lost by acquiring the right ones or the wrong ones? So instead of focusing on CPA, I want to focus on da 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 da, VPA. VPA, value per acquisition, which of course is CLV. Think about it in your business school, Cassie. Who do you who do you take that marketing course with at Tuck? Scott Neslin. Scott Neslin. Now Scott Neslin is a great guy. Okay. Brilliant guy. Now, um, what's my point over here with Scott? Um, okay, so when Scott taught you CLV, <laughs> and when, when, whoever you took your marketing course with, they said this, CLV is the upper bound on how much you're going to be willing to spend to acquire a new customer. You've heard that, right? So how come nobody acts on it? So how come we're so obsessed with the floor? How low can we drive it down? Instead of saying, where is that ceiling? Okay, what is the ultimate value of that customer in net present value terms? And how much of that are we willing to spend to acquire that customer? And the rest of it, we're going to put in our pocket as profits. That's what we should be focusing on instead, right? And, and this is why it's really important to do the CLV calculation properly, because the way that most of you are doing it is not only incorrect, but too low. You're setting the ceiling too low, and therefore you're underspending on acquisition, and you're not reaching as far as you can to get some really, really valuable customers who will be worth it. And when those customers are out there, the amount that you spend on acquisition is trivial. So think about all the times that you spend arguing about, oh, should we spend $5.50 or $5.49 on a certain you know, Google keyword? So I'm going to point to a particular study over here. Uh, and so just look at the headline. Just look at the title of the article. Measuring the CLV of customers acquired through Google-sponsored search. So th in this case, it's, it's not even kind of a cool tech firm. This is a, a mid-tier chemical manufacturer in the Midwest, okay, just to prove the generality of the concepts that we're talking about. And they wanted the answer to that question. They, they're sitting around arguing about what they should be spending on keywords. And you know what they did? They, they ran the kinds of models that I'm going to talk about next, and they found out that those that we acquire, in this case through Google Sponsored Search, but this is not an ad for Google, although they love when I present this, okay? Customers acquired through channel A are hundreds of dollars more valuable than customers acquired through channel B. And so the pennies that we're arguing about when it comes to acquisition, it's ridiculous. We should be spending all our time figuring out how those customers from channel A are different from the, the customers from channel B, and then figure out where they live, where we can fish for more like them, and pay a lot to do so. Okay, so I really want to focus a lot more on, on getting people to, to use CLV, not just kind of plugging it into other kinds of things, but in a, in, a, in a big strategic way. Win over the CFO on CLV and customer equity, much, much easier, much more impactful than trying to do it off branding. So let's talk a little bit about CLV. Duh, you know that already. How do you calculate CLV? The answer to that are the two words that I hate the most. It depends, okay? It depends, oh. And what does it depend on? The business setting. So I want to give you a little quiz over here. 
I'm going to show you what I love doing is scraping the financial statements that the companies put out there to see what they're saying about the size and value of their customer bases. So here are recent reports from Vodafone and Amazon, okay, trying to convey the size of their customer base. I can't argue with the numbers on the page here. I assume the numbers are factually correct, but the implication that Vodafone has 10.8 million pay monthly customers, and, and that would mean kind of American style, you know, pay, you know, a monthly contract sort of thing, versus um, Amazon saying they have 188 million customers. I can't argue with the numbers, but I can argue with the implications. In one of these cases, I say the number is grossly misleading. In the other case, I say it's totally fine. So here's my quiz question for you. Which one of these two is the grossly misleading one? Okay, I want you to vote on it. How many people say that Vodafone's claim of how many customers they have is grossly misleading? And how many people say Amazon's claim of how many customers they have is grossly misleading? The Amazons have it. And why is it? The Amazons are correct. What, what, what's wrong with this number? Well, no, no, we're just talking at this point to strictly number of customers. It's this, this whole kind of arbitrary definition, right? It's customers who have done something over the last 12 months. For most of us, certainly for me, I'm buying stuff from Amazon pretty much every week, right? So, you know, if I went like, you know, six months without buying something from Amazon, I'm dead, okay? Or I'm in Antarctica or something like that, which might be worse, okay? Uh, but they would say, oh, well, look, he bought stuff in the last year. He's an active customer. And then there's people like my Aunt Harriet, and all of you have an Aunt Harriet, who buys stuff from Amazon, you know, maybe once every five years. So they are active customers. They're just very slow. They're just infrequent. They'd be written off. Amazon, as brilliant as they are, has no idea how many customers they have. It is impossible for Amazon to know. So what's the distinction between Vodafone and Amazon? What's the, the, the basic business model distinction? Don't tell me telecom and e-commerce. Uh, e I don't care about that. It's all about... It's all about subscription transactional versus uh, subscription contractual versus transactional. They are completely different worlds. To me, I really mean this. This distinction over here is far more important, far more interesting, and far more complex than B2B versus B2C. Okay, client versus vendor, uh, domestic versus international, you know, 2013 versus 2003. Those are really artificial distinctions. This is one that's permanent, enduring, and it really matters. And when it comes to CLV, the way you do the calculations is completely different for one versus the other. If you try to take the CLV formula for one and apply it to the other, you'll get a number, but it is garbage. Let me ask you the next, let me ask you two more questions. First of all, which one of these worlds are most of you in? Which one of these worlds is, is more common for, for, for most e-commerce activities? Or most commerce in general? It's the second one, the non-contractual one. Question two, which one of these is more difficult to actually do the calculation in? Non-contractual, why? Because in the contractual world, the customer raises his hand and says, I'm leaving now, I'm not renewing, it's been nice doing business with you, but you can cross me off. But you can't do that with Amazon. Amazon, or any other non-contractual firm, has to guess, has to probabilistically estimate whether you're sleeping or whether you're dead. Okay, and that's the, that's the problem. That's why Amazon, in the example I gave you, they said, let's do it over, say, a year. Let's use a year. And do you know why they chose a year, by the way? Do you know why they chose a year? Then you know? Because a year is approximately how long it takes the Earth to rotate around the sun. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's how long it does. If you count, that's... What the hell does that have to do with people's buying things? It doesn't. It is completely arbitrary. And so the period that they use for me should be much, much, much shorter than the period they use for Anne Harriet. And why are they using the same periodicity? And you're not going to hear people say this about Amazon very often. It's because they're either lazy or stupid. It's because it would be too complex for them to figure out what would be that, the right kind of hiatus to use to decide whether this person is sleeping or dead. And that's why people would rather avoid the calculations in the non-contractual setting because this is difficult. 
but you're smart people. You're being paid beaucoup dollars. Figure it out. So the stupid uh, CLV formula, that, and then Scott's a great guy, but the one that he probably gave you at Dartmouth and the ones that you might have gotten from, I don't know, Don Lehman at Columbia or Joel Steckel at NYU or any place in between, they probably showed you this whole formula. It's the sum you know, of the retention to the T over one. You've seen the formula before, and God forbid some of you actually use it in a non-contractual setting. It is wrong. The word retention makes no sense in a non-contractual setting. Okay, it makes a lot of sense in a contractual setting. We have these customers. We know we have these customers. They're under contract with us. Okay, will we keep them around? But the word retention is meaningless in a non-contractual setting. I don't want to see people use it. Okay, because you have these sporadic, weird, horrible, random purchases taking place. It's a mess. This is the data structure that you're all dealing with in the non-contractual world, except for the fact that you have, say, millions of customers instead of four. You have long time periods. You have lots of different activities, not just transaction, transaction. You're going to have you know, contacts with customer service and contacts with the customers and inbound app on marketing, all kinds of stuff going on. But it's this basic structure over here, and it's a mess. Okay, and so you basically have two choices. Everyone's choosing choice number one, which is let's invest in big data. Let's bring in a few Hadoop clusters that's going to help us organize all of this stuff. You can do that. Good luck to you. Enjoy it. But if you really want to get to the answer, if you really want to get the CLV, you don't want to overcomplicate it. You want to simplify it. In fact, you want to throw the data away and you want to replace it with the characteristics that really matter. Because most of the stuff you see up here does not matter when it comes to actually projecting CLV. So what does matter? What does matter? I heard Cassie say it, I heard her refer to it at least, and the words that when she said them, all of you didn't even blink an eye, which is good. Let's go back to the origins of big data. Let's go back 50 years to our forefathers in direct marketing. None of us wants to admit that we came from direct marketing. We'd rather admit that we came from Neanderthals than direct marketing, although they're kind of the same, really. So. Um, so when our forefathers in direct marketing were grappling with big data in the 1960s, it's because they were writing a lot of crap down on index cards and it was just too much for them to handle. So they said, we need to simplify this. We need to throw out the useless data and just retain the useful data where useful is defined as stuff that will help us figure out the future value of our customers. And so they did a little what we today call data mining, okay, and they realized that they could throw all the data away and just keep three things. What are those, th those three bits of information? Tell it to me. Let me hear it. RFM. RFM. How many of you are familiar with the holy trinity of RFM? Raise them high. Raise them proudly. The rest of you, shame on you. Okay? Or shame on your marketing professors for not teaching it to you. Okay, so it's all about RFM. This is what our forefathers in direct marketing told us. And man, oh man, oh man, were they right. Okay, and I'll show you a bunch of examples of just that. So basically, all I want to do is throw away the useless data a lot of that stuff, I don't need to know exactly when the fourth to last purchase occurred. It's, it's irrelevant when it comes to predicting future value. Just tell me the time of the last purchase, recency, the number of purchases made over some well-specified time period, and the average size of those purchases. It is remarkable that if you give me just those three things, I can explain pretty much everything in CLV, or I can predict everything in CLV that's predictable. It's still going to be really random. There's still going to be some you know, faith involved. But it's as good as it's going to get. And if you want to layer on stuff like you know, the valence of their messages with customer service and the number of people in their social network and stuff like that, go ahead. Layer it on. I'm fine with that. I'll give you methods to do that. But you're going to find, first of all, you don't want to start with that stuff. You want to start with RFM. And you're going to find that once you start layering on these other things, how much it changes or improves your ability to predict future lifetime value is really, really small. Most models that show that, say, social media or social networks are predictive of future value, to me, when I see that, I know that it's a shitty model. That's a technical term. Okay? <laughs> if you start with bad measures and build your model on that stuff, yeah, you're going to find some predictive value from it. But once you bring in the good measures, all that other stuff just basically gets blown away, for the most part. So that's what I want to do. I do. You know what these things are. Basically, what I want to do is this. You give me these three things, I'm going to give you my best guess about what CLV is. And when I put up this sort of equation over there, it seems to be begging for some kind of 
big, scary, machine learning, Bayesian neural net, horrible thing. All of you are out there hiring these Russian PhD physicists to kind of just crunch data and predict things. But you know what? It's not a matter of computational power. It's not a matter of math skills. I'm a pretty simple guy. It's a matter of knowing what story to tell. If you have the right story that relates past behavior to future value, the calculations are actually pretty easy. And that's what I want to show you. So first thing I want to do is I want to tell you about the story and then just very briefly blow past the calculations because they're so easy, they're so transparent, we can do them in Excel, all right? So I've got five quick case studies for you. Number one, big online music firm. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, j just, just for fun, okay, so it's a bunch of customers acquired. It's great to hear everyone talking about cohorts. It's great. Here's a cohort of customers. We're going we're gonna to do the thing that machine learning people like to do. Is we're going to split the data set into a first half that we use to calibrate our models, a second half to see how well they work. But then ultimately, and this is the important part, we want to use all of the data for our CLV analysis. Okay, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, okay, fine. That, that's, that's the basic setting. Uh, here's the story. This is the story. If you are in the non-contractual world, and most of you are, this is the story to start with. Many data sets will have little variations from it, but it's amazing at how good this model is. And this is not a model I invented. This is a model I stole from someone else. Uh, I was developed 25 years ago, but I'm developing all my own CLV models, and through the academic review process, they're saying, hey, go compare your model to this body of die model in an out of sample period. And I found out it's hard to beat. So around 10 years ago, I went to the white flag and said, if you can't beat him, join him. And I've become just a strong advocate for someone else's model. And I've spent a lot of time since then trying to bring it to the masses. Not to say you're the masses. Trying to bring it to the elite. Uh, trying to say it's actually accessible. And it works really well. So here's the basic story. You're going to read this and you say, well, that's dumb. That's ridiculous. That's what I thought, too. But it's, it's amazing how well this, this story works. Here it is. Everyone has an underlying unobservable purchasing rate. Okay? But the point is that it's unobservable. So your purchasing rate might be you buy, you know, on average once every two weeks, and your purchasing rate might be on average once every two months. That doesn't mean that like clockwork you're buying every two weeks. It means that over the course of two years you're buying about 104 times, right? So everyone has this underlying purchasing rate, but they're buying randomly around it. Sometimes they go through a binge and they buy a lot of stuff and they get cold for a while. Who the hell knows why? And we could bring in all kinds of covariates if we want to try to explain why. Not hard to do that. I'm not that interested in doing that, not in the case of CLV, because what I'm interested in is to make projections out, say, forever. Okay? And the little wiggles and jiggles that are happening today and tomorrow are not going to matter that much in the big, big picture. If I want to do some kind of attribution thing or marketing mix model, and I really do care about all those little micro, local wiggles and jiggles, fine. Different model, different issue. But in the long run, all I care about are people's long-run purchasing rates, which vary tremendously across people. One of the things that we all learn, one of the things that we all agree on is the celebration of heterogeneity, the 80-20 rule, the kinds of pictures that Rob Grimshaw showed earlier this morning. People vary tremendously. Okay? There, there's no average customer. Okay? That's one part of the story, but this is a fairly static story. It gets dynamic in a ridiculously simple way. It's called a body of die model for a reason. What we say is everyone has this built-in, unobservable dropout propensity. It's like everyone has an alarm clock. And they buy at a certain you know, steady rate. But then when the alarm clock goes off, boom, the rate drops to zero, and they never buy again. Doesn't that sound weird? Right? And of course, those dropout propensities vary across people, too. There's the body of die model stolen from Dave Schmidtline, Don Morris, and Richard Colombo. Uh, it's, it's a remarkably effective model. It requires very few parameters. It's very easy to add on other bells and whistles if you really need them. But again, if our, if our goal is CLV, they're probably not that important anyway. One of the issues about it, I defy you to go back to the 1987 paper by these three wonderful gentlemen and try to read it. Because it's a, even for you know, a technical person, it's a technical horror show. It's a mess. Give it to your Russian physicists and their heads will explode. I mean, it's really, it's really horrible. So that's why what I've been trying to do, the paper lay dormant for about 10 years until we realized how good it is. 
uh, and now we're just kind of pushing it all the time. One of the things that I'm trying to do is to try to make this model as accessible as possible. So one of the things that I did in the, in the middle 2000s was instead of trying to convince people to actually do the math and the horrible calculations that's required by the original version of the model, I asked the question, how much can we dumb it down or how little can we dumb it down so that we can implement this thing very easily in Excel? So I don't want to call too much attention to the stuff that's going on here, but this is actually, this is really, really, really simple. Okay, don't let the gammas this and that scare you. In fact, they shouldn't. It's simple for two reasons. Number one, the only inputs to it are recency, the time of the last transaction, and frequency, the total number of transactions. Build a separate model for spend. Glad to share that with you as well. So, so it's very, very easy from a data input standpoint. It's very easy, literally, to, to, to download this spreadsheet over here and just cut and paste your own data into it and hit solve and boom, it's done. And even the stuff that's going on within each of these cells over here, while it might not be immediately obvious to you what's going on there, in fact, it'd be weird if, it, if you had any sense of what, what's going on there, but it's very, very simple. And to run this model on, you know, you know I don't know, whatever, 2,000 customers takes a tenth of a second. It's just nothing. And so it gives you that ability to run this model over and over and over for different, different uh, acquisition campaigns, different cohorts of customers, different products, different geographies, whatever. It, it lets you actually embrace CLV in a way, instead of having to go to some vendor and paying them a lot of money and waiting for results, it lets you really own it. Okay? Next thing I want to do is I want to uh, not only convince you that this model works, but hell with my model or someone else's model that I stole it. Um, I want to show you four important pictures, four pictures that no matter what model you're using for CLV or any kind of repeat purchase forecasting, you must look at these four pictures and you must demand that your, that your vendors provide them to you. The first one is not very impressive. It is a histogram. It is saying, for this, this collection of customers, how many purchases did they make in our observation period and what does the model predict? Looks nice, right? Nice? This is a really low bar. The performance of the model, its ability to tell us the, the light versus the heavy buyers, you know what this tells us about the model? It tells us that the model might not suck. That's high praise, isn't it? It's very, very easy to come up with a bad model that will do well on this picture. Okay, so if your model does badly on this picture, then the model does suck. <laughs> If you do well in this picture, it just means, okay, we can go on to picture number two. So the problem with this picture is that it's a static snapshot. We don't like snapshots. We like motion pictures. So here's the motion picture. Let's see how well the model can predict sales for this cohort of customers over time. Calibration period, forecast period. Beat that. Come on. You can't. All right? It's, it's, it's really, really, really great. I mean, we're, with, we're within 1% for you know, a long, long period of time. Go out for, for you know, two, three years instead, it's going to be just as close. But by the way, when do you sell the most stuff? What are you all starting to obsess over right now? What time of year drives you crazy? Christmas, right? You want to see the impact of Christmas on this online music seller? Because it's huge. Are you ready for it? That. This is why we like to look at the cumulative picture first, because the cumulative picture smooths out all that week-to-week -week and seasonal nonsense and just tells us, are we just generally capturing what's worth capturing? But we want to look at that nonsense as well, and that's picture number three. So in picture number three, we see all the promotions. We see all the seasonality. We see Christmas over here, where you know, you're out there buying CDs for your friends and loved ones and then you're home eating pumpkin pie with grandma and then spending the check that she gave you. I mean, that, that's the, the Christmas holiday right there. By the way, that pattern is what we see all the time in e-commerce. Uh, so in any given week, this model's terrible. And this is where machine learning breaks down. Because machine learning would work so hard to try to capture all these ups and downs and wiggles and jiggles, but you know what? We don't care. Because when it comes to COV, all we want to know is, are we capturing that overall baseline? And do we get that good feeling in the belly that if we were to project this out for another, you know, thousand years or so, uh, whether it would continue to capture that overall baseline of purchasing? And a lot of this other stuff above and below it, hate to say it, marketers, it's noise. It's temporary, transient things, but not necessarily fundamental changes in behavior. In fact, this online music firm is no longer in business. Do you know why? Amazon. 
Okay? Amazon blew them out of the water. Amazon entered the music market right around here. And you see almost no direct impact of it. All the impact of Amazon was on acquisition. It was customers who never got acquired here, and they kind of just, you know, they just didn't have any oxygen. Okay, so, so this is picture number three. And so again, I'm trying to emphasize a couple of things. Number one, this basic pattern, in this case here, I should emphasize here, this, this ramp up is because we defined the cohort as the first quarter of the year. So we're adding on, adding on, adding on new customers. We turn the faucet off over here, and then it's just this buy to you die process. It always looks like this. I, I invite you, I dare you, I defy you to show me a picture, not for a firm as a whole, but for one of your cohorts, a group of customers acquired at a certain time, look at what they do collectively over time, and it's always going to look like that. It's just a question of how quickly it declines and how much other extraneous noise stuff there is, which you might want to capture, and it's not hard to do so, but for CLV purposes, it's not mission critical. Okay, so there's picture number three. Picture number four is the really, really important one. Is there, is there a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So there's clearly there's more, absolutely positively. But this is for the cohort as a whole. So for the cohort as a whole, we're throwing the nets out there, we're going to pull in big fish, little fish. Okay, and so for the cohort as a whole, we're going to see this kind of shakeout occurring. The ones who are still buying with us out here are the whales, okay, and they might be buying more than they bought originally. But when we look at the cohort level, this is what we see. But clearly what we want to do is drill down deeper, which is what I'm about, about to do next, to understand how the customers differ from each other. Because this is nice to know, but it's too aggregate, exactly to your point. So in fact, the, the fourth picture is the really, really difficult one. This is the real challenge. Because it's actually, coming up with this forecast is, is harder than you think, but it's not impossible. There's a lot of different curve fitting methodologies that can actually give you either this baseline or to even capture some of the wiggles and jiggles. The hard part is, is drilling down to the customer level. So let me show you all important picture number four. And this one is very, very hard to do. And this is why I am so respectful of this particular model because it just, kicks ass on any of the models that I've come up with. So, well, I've come up with some good ones too, but this one's great. It's called conditional expectations. It's saying this. Among people who made, say, three purchases in the first half of our data set, what's our best guess of how many purchases they'll make in the second half of the data set? Naively, you would say, if they bought three in the first half, how much are they going to buy in the second half? Three. three. It never works that way because the sales always decline. They always, always do for the cohort as a whole. So what's, the, the, uh, what's our prediction over here? The model predicts 1.8, survey says eh, 1.7. It's really, really close. And so this is our ability to start drilling down and to start making different statements about the really good customers versus the not so good customers. And how important it is for us to be accurate for all of them. Because we, like, we love these customers over here. Mwah! We love those really big, valuable customers. But ultimately, these customers are more important. Why? There's so many more of them. Half of the data set is sitting over here. And unless you want to fire your customers, not a good practice. You want to make sure that you can predict what little you're going to get out of them. Because what little you're going to get out of each and every one is going to amplify when you take into account the fact that there's so many thousands of them. You want to be really careful at, at, and, and at both ends. Finally, on this example, and I'll move on real quickly, uh, RFM segmentation. So we're going to break people up into RFM, and those are the only inputs required for this model. And we're going to ask ourselves, we're going to do, this is real CLV, not the phony baloney stuff that, that you often read about, dollars and cents. This is what the customers are worth as a function of their recency, their frequency, and their monetary value. And we break them up into tercials, and we say, you know, how good are they, and how bad are they, and, and how much stuff do we want to send to them, and so on. By the way, why do we call it RFM? Why don't we call it FMR or MRF or something else? Why do we call it RFM? Because recency matters most. You see it all the time. Look at it. The differences across recency, zoom, 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 are huge. 
And they, they swamp the differences across frequency and difference across monetary value. It always works that way. Yet recency is so unsexy. Okay, you never hear companies obsessing over that like they obsess over frequency and engagement and things like that. But in terms of future predictability, it's what really matters. All right, moving on real quick. Uh, it's funny, I, I presented uh, a, a version of that deck in, in Beijing a couple of times and to a bunch of e-commerce firms over there. And I said, nah, that's the US. It's all different here. Now that was a challenge, right? That was a dare. And it turns out, I'll give you the bottom line, it's not. <laughs> So we got data from a big fashion e-tailer over there and blah, 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 multi-channel, just went through an IPO. There's the data. You can start to see what's going on. It's the same body die kind of pattern, fit the exact same cookie cutter models to it, but did it in a way to try to understand not just what these customers are going to do, and again, it's fairly predictable, but how it's going to vary based on the channel of acquisition. That's the one thing they cared about. Are the customers who we acquire through brick and mortar stores different than the customers who we acquire through e-commerce? So I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Um, one of the great things about this model is that it's because it's so easy to implement because it has so little uh, inputs and computation, it's really easy to come up with, with a scoring chart over here. Uh, and you can see this, this heat map saying that who are our best customers? The ones who bought a lot and bought recently. Who are the worst customers? The ones who have done bupkis with us. But what's interesting is this group over here, the group with high frequency but low recency, the folks who used to do a lot of stuff with us but haven't been around for a while, those customers are, are worse than these customers over here because we knew that they were live and active at some time and they haven't done anything for a while so we know or we're pretty sure that they're dead. Whereas with these customers over here, these are the Ann Harriets and you know what? She hasn't done anything in a while, just could be that she's a really light buyer, but we shouldn't necessarily write her off. So by having a, a coherent story, instead of just some kind of curve fitting thing, we can really get, come up with a much better scoring table. Uh, again, a lot of this stuff is, 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 is pretty clear. Uh, and then we can, of course, zoom in and really start to make just this much more precise statements about the CLV of these different kinds of customers. And to go one step further, we can leverage the story to not only make statements about what we expect them to buy, but even about their underlying propensities. This is a really cool thing. Are they alive or not? Okay, based on what they've done, should we be bothering contacting them or not? And again, in this case, you'll see we know the ones who have been with us very recently are definitely alive because they were just with us, regardless of how much stuff they've done. But then there's the Ann Harriets over there who have done very little, and so it could be the case that they're alive, but just very light buyers. Be careful about writing them off. As opposed to these people down here, the more you've bought, the deader you are. Right? So, so having this kind of, of matrix, which is interesting, to me, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a validation of the model. Uh, it, it's, it's letting us estimate a behavioral propensity that we can never really observe. We never know if someone's alive or not. But, but companies just love this kind of thing, to be able to, with, with some good statistical precision, um, guesstimate on which kinds of customers are alive and how it changes based on different behaviors that we might observe. That's quick case number two. Let me wrap it up. blah de blah de blah Yes, 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 yes. Uh, oh, by, by pointing out some of the differences across channel in this case. So if you look at the customers bought, uh, acquired through the catalog versus through the internet, uh, we notice in this particular case, and I don't necessarily want to draw generalized learnings from it. No, I don't. Okay, but in this case, we find out that the buy to you die process seems to work pretty well for both groups of customers, but it's different. It's different parameters. And so the, the we're seeing, at least in this case, much less death, or at least much slower death among the internet buyers in the catalogs. Mm -hmm. We work with a lot of retailers that are multi-channel, but yeah. it's not easy for them to actually look at their customers across channels. Right. Clearly leaving a whole lot of money on the table. And that's, of course, both a, an interesting practical challenge as well as an academic challenge, is how can we look at, in this case, we're looking at a separate, in, 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 here we actually have the integrated data, but they told us to break it out. Uh, and so how much do we gain by actually integrating it together? How much do we lose by our inability to do so? And how much do we have to adapt the statistical methods to get there? So great issue, love to talk about it. And I have to admit that once we start bringing in that kind of very important complication, can't do it in Excel anymore. 
But still, you can do you know, one channel at a time in Excel, you can get this good feel for it, and then I'll give you free R code that'll just let you do the whole thing uh, in a more complex way. Uh, so real quick, I'm just going to just raise these real, uh, real quickly and, and glad to take questions. Big giant uh, gaming company, man oh man, they have blown me away with what they're doing. They're using this same model, just a slight variant of it, and they're updating their CLV estimates for their, for their players every single day. I think that's a little obsessive. I don't think you really need to do that. But, but it goes back to our original opening story. They are evaluating the goodness of all of their acquisition campaigns based on not just sales and the number of people who converted, number of people signed on, based on how much they've increased the CLV. So a true forward-looking metric of the goodness of it. So we're working with them right now, a wonderful new project on sequential allocation for customer acquisition. So they have a whole big messy segmentation scheme. Okay, so we're going to you know, uh, spread our dollars out across it. We're going to wait a period, a few weeks or so, and we're going to see what's our update on the CLV for segment by segment, and then where should we reallocate our dollars. And it's just this, this iterative process over and over and over. We're just, just, just getting smarter all the time and spending your money more efficiently. Um, working with a financial advisory service. This one is really fascinating. I never even thought about this one myself, but it's an interesting flip side to CLV. That if we, if this is more in the contractual setting, but if we can understand how long people are going to stay with us and so on, it can give us just much more refined estimates of, say, financial reserves than the usual actuarial ones that, that tend to be, uh, you know, that, that companies have blind faith. Once again, this is an example of why if we use these models, we validate them carefully and convince ourselves and our senior management that these patterns are fairly general, we're not just making it up in this one case, that we can actually win over broader buy-in and, and broader applications of these kinds of models, which is great. Uh, big pharmaceutical firm, well, it's a medium-sized pharmaceutical firm, um, they, they completely trash their, their sales force. They, 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 they basically you to leave it up to the sales force, decide which accounts you want to talk to, as long as you bring in enough sales with, for us. They change it all around using these kinds of models to use our forward-looking metrics to, to predict which distributors would be the most profitable. And the, really the coolest thing about this Instead of the usual battle between marketing and sales, in this case, the, the, the models were so good at identifying really good future-looking prospects that the salespeople actually went to the marketing people and said, can you please help us identify some more prospects for us to go after? Instead of marketing people, leave us alone. So it actually developed a kind of mutual respect and, again, coordination around a more analytical go-to-market approach. Uh, so it's, just, it's nice to see examples like that. And then the holy grail example goes back to customer equity. Can we calculate the CLV for each and every customer? Can we project the number of customers we expect to come in? Can we add all that up and say, that's the value of the firm? And actually do that as a complement to the usual top-down valuation approaches. So we see today everyone's bitching and moaning about Netflix valuation, this and that. But the metrics that they're using are completely screwed up. Let's do it from the bottom up, which is something that the folks at, metrics, uh, at Netflix are actually quite good at. So, so completely revamping the way we, we do valuation as a whole. All right, I am going to leave it at that. I would be just absolutely delighted. Oh, if you're interested in learning more, two-day workshop on this stuff, whoop de doo uh, I would be just delighted to take your questions, to take your skepticism, take your concerns, thoughts about CLV stuff. Question right there. Uh, absolutely. So uh, the, the, the main goal of it is to predict, you know, the whole future, how much activity. But if we want to kind of narrow it down just to say, you know, the next year, uh, you know, who's going to do what over the next year and how much that might be influenced by different things that we're doing now, sure it could be, absolutely. One, one of the nice things about it is that it is inherently, it's, it's a ridiculously simple story which in a weird way gives it better predictive properties than models that to kind of overfit the historical data that we have. So it can be used for all kinds of, of, of future-looking goals, CLV being the ultimate. Mm -hmm. What about uh, replenishment businesses and businesses that might, in some cases, have long periods of time between replenishment? How does the model hold up from there? So the basic model stinks in a case like that. Um, in, in a situation where, where there's just kind of natural cycles that people go through or seasonality, so, for instance, we fit these kinds of models with, um, with StubHub, looking at, at people uh, you know, buying tickets for, for baseball games. 
not a whole lot of purchasing going on in November and December. So we can either bring in seasonal covariates that will kind of pick that up, or one of the things we do with StubHub, honestly, is we just kind of cut out the off season, just jam together like September to April, and then it was like, it was a tiny little dip. So, so you can either, there are ad hoc ways to do it or, or more proper ways to bring in different kinds of cyclicality to it. So whether it's cyclicality related to your customers, the business, the macroeconomy, not hard to do that. But I wouldn't start with it. I would start with the plain vanilla model, find out that it actually stinks and that sales are actually doing this, and then add that in. Uh, so, so you're asking me the risk of using this model versus a different model? Or, or this model at all. I mean, I guess, uh, are there, I mean, are, th are there things to bear in mind? For, so, for, for example, like I can imagine, if the future value of the customers out there, you have cash flow concerns? Yep. You may not want to invest in cash now. Oh, sure. No, no that, that's, that's a huge issue, but of course that transcends the model. But in terms of the model itself, in terms of a model, a, a, a good CLV model, okay, regardless of what specification you're using. First of all, remember that picture I showed you, the, the conditional expectations that said, if you bought three, our best guess is that you'll buy 1.8? None of you asked me about it. What's the variability around that? So I can make a really good statement for those three-time buyers as a whole, but there's going to be tremendous variability among them. So our ability to make statements at the individual level is very, very limited. Okay, I'm the CLV guy, and I understand that my ability to say what you will do is terrible. But my ability to say what people like you who share similar characteristics will do collectively is really, really strong. So we have to understand where's the limit of how granular we can get. And the answer is it's, it's not as granular as you'd like it to be. So that's one big issue there. Another common issue would be things like seasonality and marketing effects and all that. I imply that they're just all transient, that they all go away. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes marketing activities or, or other activities will have a more permanent effect. Big competitor enters and our customers are going to you know, leave in droves. So, so sometimes it's, you, you can't dismiss them as easily as I'm suggesting. But it's not that hard to bring them in. So again, I, I want to be completely open about all of these concerns, and I don't want to suggest that, uh, that this is a panacea you know, the, for, for every situation. We have time for one more? One more, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, so, let me, let me do my best UNICEF plea here. So we've got a bunch of startups, poor, starving startups that are trying to optimize cash and, and, and uh, build out their wonderful companies. Um, I noticed earlier you talked about this Wharton Customer Analytics Institute where you've got this wonderful trove of data scientists and researchers that are trying to think about models and we have big buckets of data all around here. Is there a way that uh, these companies in this room can, that don't have the million dollars sort of Coca-Cola budget, uh, leverage some of the resources that you have? In there are, and, and it's, it's less a matter of money and more a matter of, of kind of, you know, analytical curiosity and, and just, you know, analytical bandwidth. Because uh, like I, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, is kind of sort of this one size fits all. You're in a non-contractual setting, use this model. Okay, so right there, that's kind of cutting to the chase. And so you don't have to do a lot of evaluation. You don't have to do a lot of initial development. Okay, so the, the main point is this. The basic patterns that exist across businesses, regardless of what sector you're in, geography, whatever, are largely similar. So there's so much that you can learn, even from a mid-tier you know, uh, chemical manufacturer in the Midwest. So rather than saying, our business is different, it needs unique models and analytics and all that, that might be true. But start with tried and true methods. And even if this model doesn't work well, some of the deviations that you'll see from it will be very interesting and diagnostic by itself to tell you exactly how your business is different. And then you can start you know, uh, 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 bringing things in to accommodate some of those differences. So there's a tremendous amount that can be learned, whether it's from our research center or, or from you know, Scott Neslin or others. Uh, a lot of the, the academic stuff, we do a terrible, terrible job of, of making models accessible and communicating them in ways that you can understand and appreciate. But there's a lot of good stuff there. And through this one thing that we're doing at Wharton, we're, we're trying to, to demystify some of that. Uh, and that's, let me just go back to my little advertisement over here. That's the whole purpose of, of this session over here, is to, to boil it all down, skip all the horrible math, and bring a lot of the CLV stuff to life. Thank you for giving me that, that opportunity. <laughs> Dr. Peter, thank you so much. Sure thing. Huh? Mm -hmm.